Hey everybody, this is WebDM, I'm Jim Davis, and today we're talking about every GM's favorite subject, TPKs, right? And I think the number one reason of why someone should TPK is entirely for out-of-game reasons, right? Players are showing up late, disrespectful, time for a TPK, right? Not playing the way you want them to, time for a TPK. Got a sweet bad guy that you want him to come across, overwhelming power, awesome stats, you just homebrewed it definitely time for a TPK, right? So today on WebDM, we're talking about all of the great reasons. Hey, 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 Jim. What? Well, yeah. You okay? How, how you doing? A little concerned. I mean, I, I got a bad sleep and I still, I still need to eat breakfast, yeah, but... but like, well, I don't know that those are good reasons for a TPK. No, yeah. Yeah, when I think about it and say it out loud, those are terrible reasons for a TPK, right? Absolutely horrible reasons. What was I thinking? So, today on WebDM, we're going to talk about all the right reasons to have a TPK. So, enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by Monty Cook Games, our boon companions and creators of Old Gods of Appalachia, based on the popular podcast. PCs investigate the unknowable and protect what's important from dangers the modern industrial world can't even imagine. This is a standalone RPG with everything you need to play in an alternate Appalachia of the 1920s and 30s. Character generation, adventures, creatures, magic items, and a deep dive into the lore of the setting's history. The Kickstarter is live now, and it's already over $1 million, so don't miss this one. If that weren't all, MCG also wrote First Responders, an RPG like no other. Play as First Responders dealing with real-world crises and disasters. We're talking volcanoes, earthquakes, pandemics, skyscraper fires, nuclear meltdowns, dam breaches, and even supernatural disasters for when your campaign takes that special turn to the paranormal. You can get this game right now. Go to the MCG shop and order your copy. Speaking of which, you can use the coupon code WebDMFANS at checkout on the MCG shop and get $5 off your order. Links in the comments and description. Hi, I'm Jim Davis, and this is WebDM. Today, I want to talk about the dreaded total party kill. In a game like Dungeons and Dragons, a TPK is usually a possibility, and many players love the risk of combat precisely because their characters' lives are on the line. But a TPK can be disruptive. It leads to hard feelings, disappointment, and worst of all, it means the game is over. It doesn't have to be that way, though. It's possible to play a game like Dungeons and Dragons with the possibility of a TPK and do it responsibly. So I want to tell you guys some stories of the many TPKs I've been involved in as a player and the few that I've been involved in as a dungeon master over the years and the lessons that I've learned from them. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. So the first TPK that I was involved in was a, in a second edition game. I had joined a group that was uh, co-workers after hours, and I took over a cleric from like 13th or 14th level uh, who was a specialty priest of Lathander. And, I, you know, I played uh, Baldur's Gate before, but I wasn't too familiar with Advanced Dungeons and Dragons second edition, nor characters made with skills and powers options. And I, I played as best as I could, had a great time, but it was clearly the tail end of this epic campaign. And I came in right as the group was assaulting the final dungeon of the campaign to get at the head lich of the Cult of the Dragon and, you know, assault his lair where they're making Draco liches and things like that. And so it's, of course, takes session after session, hours and hours of play to get through all these levels. The DM had, had really crafted this thing. There's a lot of epic uh, fights in that one. And the end boss fight against Samaster was one that... that the details have <laughs> passed into memory, but moments of it stand out as being absolutely awesome, right? One character dies only to be brought back a few rounds later with a clutch spell. You know, another character dies uh, diving into a pool of lava, fighting one of the Draco Lich minions of Semaster. And after all of this is over, this Lich has the audacity to you know, break his staff of power as a final act wiping the rest of the party out as we were already weakened. There's a lot of people who would look at that and say, that sucks, you guys won, why are you dead? This is D&D. 
Right, this is dangerous. The quests that people go on, the enemies they face are dangerous. And I look at that and go, what an awesome way to end a campaign. That's my first D&D &D campaign, right? It's Pruitt's first as well. And like it set the tone for what ought to come after. These quests are dangerous. To accept one of these is, is to risk your character's life. And the DM clearly communicated all of that. And to me, that's the key lesson here is that in the right context, a TPK is fun. A TPK is epic. A TPK is a, a good capstone for a particular type of adventure. Not for every group, but it might be for yours if you've never considered it before. What's required is that the DM clearly communicate the threat, making sure that the players know what the scale and scope, the magnitude of the threat is that they're about to face is important because they might say, well, no, no, no never mind. In this case, we knew what we were getting into. We were assault, assaulting the five-level volcano dungeon of the Cult of the Dragon. This is their seat of power, their headquarters. The campaign largely had been about working the, the party working their way towards that location, fighting off waves of enemies that were trying to stop them. And now this was the last line of defense for this particular uh, evil cult. And of course they would throw everything at us. We should have expected that the staff of power would get broken the first time we saw it and recognized it for what it was. And yet, I wouldn't do anything differently, right? We're heroes. It's there. To, we're there to save the day, and we are there to fight the bad guy. And if we go down swinging and take the bad guy out with us, then that's a victory in my book and a great way to end a campaign. You just have to have the buy-in from the players in the beginning because if they're not ready for that, if, if that's not how they want to go out, it will be bittersweet uh, at best <laughs> uh, and, and could be even um, resentment building at worst. So make sure that you let them know. Make sure from the beginning and in every major combat what the threat is, what the possibilities are. And that's how you can play in a way that the party takes on threats that might be above their head, but you can feel good about it because at least they, they, they know. They made an informed decision. It was their choice to do that. Hey, everybody. This is Jim interrupting myself to tell you guys that if you want to support the show, you want to head on over to Patreon and check us out there. We've got over 230 episodes in our uh, back catalog of podcasts talking about all kinds of tabletop RPG-related subjects as well as media, culture stuff, all kinds of things. It's really awesome. Go and check us out if you want to support the show. Thanks. All right, I guess. So that's the story of my first uh, TPK as a player. But as a dungeon master, I had my first TPK after the end of a second edition campaign that began with Keep on the Borderlands, continued on through the various Against the Giants modules, and ended rather tragically in a paladin in hell. Um, the party had gotten rather far into the module, they'd gotten on the abyssal ships, they'd gotten to the lair of hell, and were starting to attack the fortress there. And there was an encounter with like a ridiculous amount of winter wolves, something like 20 or so. And in my inexperience and exuberance, I asked for 20 or so saving throws from the party. And you know, second edition characters at that level that we were playing at in the high teens are pretty tough. Lots of magic items and the like, but they're not so tough that they can withstand 20 breath weapon attacks. And one by one, characters start dropping, players are frustrated. I was immediately like, oh no, what did I do? But didn't have the presence of mind yet or experience to know how to walk that back. I figured what happened? It what happens, happens, you know? So one of the lessons I learned from this experience was that as a dungeon master, I really need to know the rules. I don't have to get them perfect. I don't have to know them by heart, but I ought to make a good faith effort to master them, to understand them, and to be fair and consistent in my rulings and how I play the monsters and NPCs that are part of the dungeon master's purview. It's really important to me because I like games where there's a real risk of character death, where Everything is on the table, right? With this, this is for keeps. And to do that, you have to have trust. You have to understand that the, the dungeon master isn't playing unfairly or, or forgetting something that could really change the outcome of a game. And if they are, you need to feel comfortable in talking about that and bringing it up. And so for me, from, as a dungeon master in those situations, I want the players to feel like they can talk to me about my rulings, that they can talk to me about rules disputes. It's very important to me. Because for me as a dungeon master, 
I am here to be an impartial judge of the world, to present it as it is without favor for any one outcome or the other, because I want to see what happens. That's why I'm playing. Players are responsible for their own abilities, spells, knowing what they can do and the like, for the decisions that they make. And it's easier to present that when I'm not trying to nudge things in their favor or fudge the rules and change them for a certain outcome. And just play the game, making changes as I need to, but, but not pushing things in any particular direction. And so the second game of Dungeons & Dragons I ever ran for my friends uh, was a third edition game. And much like the first one, uh, we had a TPK at the end of the campaign around 16th to 17th level. This time, though, it was the player's choice. They picked a fight with a dragon that had been an ally of theirs for most of the campaign that they knew to be really powerful. Magic user as well as a dragon with a horde of powerful items and a lot of allies. They wanted that wealth. They wanted the, <laughs> the clout from killing a big dragon. And so they decided to ambush him. And ambush him they did. They had a hard-fought fight with his simulacra. And when it melted into a pile of the snow after two of the party had died, one of them had been roasted by magic, the real dragon stepped out of the dim eye plane where he'd been watching everything to do battle with what remained of the party. Three of the party members immediately surrendered. And the remaining ones said that they would fight to the bitter end, but we didn't have to play through it. They accepted that their characters would just die. And for me, I felt fine with this one, All right? In the Paladin in Hell, I felt bad. I immediately knew that I had done something wrong, and the shock of it was just like, what? And I wasn't quite able to walk it back in time to say like, wait, 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 wait. That's ridiculous. It's more like four breath weapons, you know? <laughs> uh, but the second one, the Red Dragon Simulacra, I felt good about that one because it's a player's choice. They're gonna have to pick a fight with this NPC. This NPC was never gonna attack them, right? They were, got greedy. They wanted that magic item, they wanted the, the Dragon Slayer uh, title, they wanted all of that treasure. And so they picked a fight with a, with a dragon that they knew was incredibly powerful. And my favorite part of that particular one was when the Simulacra ate the Dragon Slayer Paladin, uh, killing them instantly, and, and the rest of the party like, oh no, we're in over our heads. And a few rounds later they realized they were fighting an illusion. And that was the fun part. <laughs> All right, so those are some fun ones, right? Campaign ends and big TPKs and things like that. Um, but when you have multiple TPKs in the first session, it can really kill the mood of a campaign. And you've got to work to keep that campaign going, or rather just off the ground to begin with. So uh, shortly after the Red Dragon Simulacra TPK, I was in a game where I went through four characters before I found a character that was able to survive uh, up to 18th or 19th level, I think. And those first four characters, I don't remember much about them, <laughs> but I remember them dying in the most gruesome ways as we explored the ruined undercity of this sort of post-apocalyptic Dungeons and Dragons world and getting petrified by cockatrice and you know, killed in gladiator pits. And we tried all kinds of things. Every time we die, one of the other players would leave, right? Started with five or six, and by the end of it, it was just me and Pruitt. And those characters that we made, those last ones that we made, survived till the end of the campaign for many, many levels. But what I learned from that experience was that if you're gonna play this way, if death is on the table, if the possibility that you don't get to play this character that you really wanna play is a possibility, then you have to be committed to keeping the game moving because there's gonna be hard feelings. There's gonna be disappointment. Players get really attached to their characters and they always have, right? Like don't let the crusty grognards fool you. They've always gotten attached to their characters because it's Dungeons and Dragons. Like, you know, that's why the game is fun. And so it's, it's a, it's an attitude or mindset from a player and the DM that says, yeah, we, this is an unexpected outcome. We didn't think that all the characters were gonna die, but it's dangerous, we're on an adventure, it's a possibility, we're ready to keep moving. We want to keep moving. We don't wanna wallow in the disappointment and despair and think that, oh gosh, we can, can't do anything. We wanna say, yes, there is a way we can play this game. Let's figure it out. And for me in that moment, it was especially burning. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm gonna make a character that survives this campaign world. And I did by making a magic user, a wizard in third edition. <laughs> 
So yeah, the important thing with the TPK is to get the players playing again, right? That's why they came here. And an unexpected end to the game from a TPK is a real buzzkill. There's a lot of different ways to get them back in the game, but really the thing is, is just a commitment to not stopping and sitting too long with those feelings of disappointment. Acknowledge them, honor them, move on, keep playing. Next TPK I remember being involved in was in original Dungeons and Dragons. Um, third edition was over. I was looking to experience some of that retro clone action, especially from original D&D, &D, which I heard was really tough. Um, I wanted to play a magic user in it and see how far I could get. Well, one day we're on the second level of the dungeon or so, and it's most of the group, some people are absent, and we found a mural where there are a bunch of monsters in it, Medusa, Gorgon, the typical petrifying creatures that D&D has, as well as mounds of treasure, just like heaps of coins and magic items and the like. And the trick was anything that touched this wall, this mural, activated it, and everything in the mural became real. So the monsters would be there, but so would the treasure. We set up a plan, we figured out how we were going to fight these monsters, all that. We prepared our battlefield, touched the wall, and immediately the dice did not go our way. And one by one by one, we're all dead. And, and TPK, right? Dean felt really bad about it. it. Didn't seem to sit right with him. And while some of us were ready to roll up new characters and get started next week, there were a lot of members of the group who were also very, pretty upset about it, because this was original D&D, &D and we had like third and fourth level characters. So. The next week, DM revealed and said, you know, I made a mistake. I'd like to do over. Let's start at initiative. We've touched the wall, we're rolling initiative. Let's play the fight out again. I'll do better this time and get my uh, rules right, you know, because you know, DM's there to uh, make sure they're fair and impartial uh, judge and referee for the players. And so what I loved about this, <laughs> and what I, I thought was really cool about this, not just the like, hey, I made a mistake, let's play this over. Uh, but we had a source of new PCs built into the game. And even if he had said, yeah, that this is a fair TPK. Yeah, I made a mistake with the rules, but what happened happened and let, let's keep going. We knew that we could immediately make new P PCs and jump right back in it. Right. My character had a will set up <laughs> so that all of his treasure and his notes and his maps would go to his next of kin, who would be my next character. That way, I still had access to the information, I still had a connection to what was going on. This is the key part about this lesson, is that if the source of new PCs needs to be connected to what's happening in the campaign. In the case of the original Dungeons and Dragons game, these are other adventurers who've shown up to this remote outpost to go to this mega dungeon and, and make a name for themselves and get some uh, treasure. But if it's an adventure path, then maybe it's a faction that's offering the PC support. And you know, if they're important enough or influential enough, maybe they got some raised deads on hand for the players. You know, maybe they have some sort of way of getting the bodies back, of rescuing them. Something that you can use to say, hey, not only can you potentially play the same characters again, you can get them back, but there's new characters that you can play that don't need to be brought up to speed, that it doesn't seem weird to start playing who don't have a connection to it. They're already here. They're already part of this adventure. You can just play them. And it's really important because it's how you build resiliency and insurance to make sure that your campaign has life after a TPK. All right, last one. This one's not about a TPK. It's about a TPK that my party avoided. So we're playing Labyrinth Lord, right? It's typical characters or third or fourth level, got a bunch of henchmen kind of scenario. And there's a group of bad guys in the mega dungeon that use a lot of alchemists' fire. They're a fire cult, so it's to be expected. And the party, of course, uses a lot of alchemist fire. They're low level BX characters. It's to be expected. And so, we get into what I have since <laughs> come to think of as the napalm balloon fight, 
which was this brutal melee right at the threshold of a secret door into the cult's lair. And it was one of those where henchmen are dying left and right. There's multiple pools of alchemists' fire lighting up the place. Everybody's taking damage, but they're high enough level that, that there's a stalemate for a few rounds. And I can see it, right? I can see that this is not going to end well because the bad guy reinforcements are just going to keep coming. And so I just remind the players, hey, the way behind you is clear. There are places you can block it off to make sure the pursuers can't follow. It is an option and I'm not going to penalize you for it. That's how I run games. I don't particularly like penalizing players and their characters for running away and the like. It's already hard enough <laughs> to get uh, players to recognize that running away is an option. Uh, just getting a free attack on them feels weird at that point. Feels unfair. So. The point of it is, is that I don't force particular encounters on uh, the party, right? If the party goes somewhere and there is an enemy of a certain strength that I predetermined or roll up, then that's what's there. And I'll do my best to communicate that threat clearly as per our second lesson. But if the player chooses to keep on going, then that's their choice. And I don't feel bad about this. I don't feel like I'm forcing anything or putting them in a tight spot as long as there's the chance or the possibility that they could exit the situation. As long as it's like, yeah, you, you're you not trapped here. You could leave. You can run from this encounter. It's not like, uh, you know, these things are going to follow you after that brutal battle. They might try to track you later, but they got their own dead to recover from. You've been killing them left and right. Like, they don't want to mess with you. They just want to drive you away, you know? Another option here is surrender. Players are loath to surrender their characters. It's, it's not something they seem to like to do. But if you establish early on that amongst humanoids, amongst intelligent people of this world, even when they're in conflict, that they surrender, capture, and ransom each other regularly, then you can rest assured and tell your players that like, yeah, you'll just get caught, ransomed, or have a chance to escape, or become a double agent and turncoat and, you know, turn the bad guys into your own asset, something like that. If you never get surrendered, you never have a chance to play those kinds of scenarios. So it's important to me when I'm running a game to leave an exit open, to not block off all the routes for the party. And especially when they're getting into trouble and then they're <laughs> picking their own fights, to be able to back out of that and say, yep, it's cost us too much already. It's time for us to go. That's important to me. And it's important to me as a dungeon master because I'm not trying to kill the party. I do not want them all to die, right? This is the paradox of playing in this way, which is that you want the possibility that it could all end because that's what makes it sweeter. That's what makes it great, <laughs> you know? It's the rush. But if it actually happens, that sucks. And so if you don't want that, if you don't want to end in a TPK, then it's important to make sure the players have a way to back out of a situation that's getting in over their heads. And if they do, that you respect that. And if the enemies follow and the like, then let the dice play out and see what happens. It's a possibility of escape, and sometimes the possibility is closed. Sometimes the story is, yeah, you got in over your head, and this is where your characters meet their end. And it's that unpredictability, it's that we don't know, which makes the game so great. It makes it awesome. And it's a shame that there are so many people who see it as an end, as a finality, as, as nothing but a, a fail state when all the characters in the party die. And for me personally, I don't. As long as it's fair, as long as it's an outcome of play that was interesting, that it resulted from the player's decisions and the unpredictability of the dice, that it's not something foisted or forced on them, then it's a fair outcome. And the dice tell their own story. If, if we knew everything that was going to happen, the game would be much less fun. And so it's important, I think, to play in a manner where this worst case scenario is still a possibility. It's still there, maybe small, right? Maybe just for the first few levels or the like, but even 20th level, fifth edition characters can't take too many AOEs before they drop, you know? And if you never leave it open as a possibility, then you're cutting yourself off from so many different options of play. So think about uh, some of my own experiences, how you run your own games. Uh, of course, there's many different ways to run RPGs, and ultimately, whichever one is the one you have the most fun with uh, is the way to go. But I do think it's worthwhile to think about the ways in which we can mercilessly slaughter every character in the party responsibly and fairly.
Hey everybody, hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what we do here on the channel, want to support us, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that bell to get those notifications. And if you want to support us further, go and check us out over on Patreon, where we have over 236 podcast episodes and more. And guess what? You may not have known this, but we're writing a book. You can still pre-order it. So check out the link in the description and get yourself a pre-order copy of Weird Wastelands. See y'all next week. This isn't quite a TPK. This is about a TPK that was avoided and could have gone really bad. But it's nevertheless uh, taught me a lesson and cemented a particular lesson that I was uh, percolating. Uh, that doesn't make any fucking sense. Uh, <laughs> cement, percolating cement. Hey, everybody. Of course, uh, if you liked the show, be sure to hit... This is another story about a TPK, except this one isn't a real TPK. It's about one that I avoided, or the players avoided, rather. I'm really uh, getting brain fried right here at the end, so it's important that I get all of the good brain medications that I need to stay sharp and focused and the like. You can help us out with that by supporting the show. So <laughs> we will see you next week when we talk about more RPG stuff. Goddamn. <laughs>